as the third book of canon law is for us. And whilst I, as much as you, want to see that the instruments, the documents, the instructions on how to win in court, how to help people overcome the system, are absolutely vital. The only thing that will ensure that what we do will not be in vain and what all those brave people have done is not in vain is to consume and replace the corrupt tools that the system rests on. This is a kingdom of ideas that we're dealing with, their world. A kingdom of ideas to control the mind, the collective minds. And that is what we must change. So thank you again, and I hope uh, as we go through these talks, as we go through this information, that you find and get something out of it always. And thank you again, and I look forward to your questions. Very good, Frankie. That, that's uh, some really uh, really good insight that you're sharing with us tonight. Um, we don't have a whole lot of questions yet, so possibly can we feed from there <clears throat> into how this may uh, continue or maybe uh, go into see how to succeed in court since those are some of the main issues being uh, presented to everyone today. Absolutely. Well, one of the things that, that is good for us to do is to question. And you probably notice that what happens is that people are constantly looking for the immediate remedy to their problems. And if they don't see successes, and sadly many people on the internet lie, so there are people who say that we're having successes and they don't, that they will uh, gravitate towards that. And in some cases, I actually spend a lot of money paying for, for information that is basically a, a, a scam. But the point I'm making is when we question what has changed through Eucadia, I would suggest two things have changed. And these two things have changed across the board, whether one is listening to Eucadia or not. The first is competence. I'd suggest to you that six months ago or 12 months ago, if you use the word competence, when people are looking for remedy, they'd say, whatever. I mean, if it works, it works. I don't need to be competent. It wasn't, it wasn't seen as a critical issue. When people were looking for remedy, it was a matter, is the remedy going to work? Competence was not an input. Now, I'd suggest to you now, because we, we have constantly, like a broken record, spoken of competence over and over and over again, there isn't anyone out there who is claiming remedy who now does not include competence as a key ingredient. Now, that is a historic shift across the board, as I say, whether or not. The other one is the dwindling of fear. Fear is one of the biggest, or the lack of fear, the changing of fear, the loss of fear, the immunity to fear is one of the biggest changes that people are facing. Now, you go to court, it doesn't mean that you will succeed even if you are fully competent with the tools because at the end of the day, they're controlling the court. Yes, most people are going to court now knowing a hell of a lot more than anyone else in that room. So determining the success is still a variable. But one thing you, I hope everyone can, can reflect on honestly when they think, well, what has changed? And it is that we no longer fear as we did. Why? Because virtue, the concept of honour, competence, respect, is conquering. So maybe that motto, Vincent Pericula Virtus, virtue conquers peril, is true after all. <laughs> Well, that, that is true. Um, well, you, we've seen, many of us have seen and witnessed uh, that's the case. Now, I do have a question from guest 
three that was sent to you um, in the forum, but there's a message here saying that Gerald just sent it to you. I was wondering if you could answer that question. Uh, is, is this talking about um, Celtic astro astronomy, astrology? It was a long question. Is what is what uh. S three was talking about. It's a very long question, and uh, they didn't want to retype it here. So, Gerald oh yes, he said he said yes. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, the question is um, about astronomy and astrology, and whether the Druids had a different aspect to astrology and astronomy from the uh, Persian. Uh, horoscope, and if so, can we gain an understanding of it, and um, where can we go and find that? And well, the answer is uh, yes, they did, and yes, you can. If you go to the very first chapter of Libor Clan Glass, Book of the Green Race, it actually describes to you the essential tenets of Celtic, Druidic, and uh, Bronze Age astronomy, which divided the heavens into a house of eight equal parts, and not the corrupted, <coughs> excuse me, model of the Persians, who created the horoscope system to consume, mask, and corrupt astronomy, because astronomy and astrology were, as you imagine, how do you how do you stop someone from looking up in the sky? I mean other than blinding them, uh, you can't. So the problem with astronomy and astrology was it was an ancient art of knowledge that anyone with education could tap into. Well, the Persians couldn't stand for it. They could not stand for it. Uh, and so they created this, this system to basically mask and cause people to go up. And instead of looking at positions of stars and positions of the heavens, they started to look at shapes and animals in the sky, and then, of course, claiming that's what the ancients looked at. The ancients were far smarter <laughs> than we are. I mean, some of the horoscopes, the reason they put a 13th horoscope in now was to keep us off balance, because, again, uh, people are becoming more adept, so they want to keep it, keep it spinning. But if you go and look at the opening chapter of Lieber Clan Glass on one-island.org, you will see the basic tenets of uh, Druidic astronomy and astrology. And uh, I look forward to your feedback. All right, very good, thanks. Uh, there's a question here on the chat. Is there a court set up in one heaven yet where we can file a claim against the system or the ages of the system for um, injury, harm, or theft? There are courts, structure, established and and we did previously use them in uh, the very first actions that were being developed before we we opened up and and started to um, share more of this with with people the reason that the courts are not in session or opening or sitting at the moment is that the court really relies upon a base form of law to be in at least a completed stage to ensure that any adjudication and any judgment cannot be argued at any point in the future as being unlawful, incomplete, presumptive, uh, or an aberration. I know it seems absurd when, when they are literally ignoring their own rules. They are throwing people in prison they are doing the most outrageous things. Why would we set ourselves a higher standard in the midst of that? But really the issue of, of setting a higher standard is we represent the law. We represent the restoration of the law and there's no point in the courts behaving as a mimic to their courts. I'm sure they'd love us to do that. I'm sure they'd love our courts to get running and behave potentially as badly as they, a tit for tat. But that is not the objective of the law. The objective is to finish the base for the courts 
to be formed at a grassroots level and, and not to simply get into a shooting contest with them on uh, who has the upper hand. Look, I, I, I know it's frustrating for everybody. It's frustrating for me, and it's certainly frustrating to see them ignore them, them, their own rules. But the, the things need to be turned on in the right order, and it's taken longer, unfortunately, to do the work on the cannons before the courts and, indeed, the banks are turned on to help. So that was a long-winded answer. I'm sorry, but that's the rationale of why it's not turned on yet. That's, that's helpful. Thank you, Frank. Um, we, keep, we have a caller that's coming on and uh, that they just dropped off again um, that are placing themselves in the queue. So any of, you all, if, uh, any of you all know who that is, let them know they're getting in the queue. Uh, they just need to stay there uh, so they press star 8 so I can unmute them. Um, all right. Uh, back to the Skype uh, chat room. Got another question. There's someone here uh, facing a plea hearing on the 26th and possibly facing prison from charges uh, for five years from some secret indictment. The question is that if they do an EDP and I'm competent uh, and they still send me to prison, can they use the great writ? Yeah, the great writs are there for, absolutely the great writs are there for dealing with courts that are ignoring their own rules. But I would, I would suggest uh, when you listen to the previous talk shoes and you, and you look at the material that we've presented there, if you're facing uh, criminal charges, then it's the EDP, firstly and foremostly, an EDP is merely a claim of right. Let's let's always be clear on what we're doing with an EDP. An EDP is nothing more than a claim of right. It's an administrative procedure. That's it. You do it, and it's just one tick. That's all it is. That's all it is. Now, when you get into the parry and thrust of court, it's understanding exactly what's taking place in terms of consent, in terms of jurisdiction, in terms of uh, not accepting offers, in terms of staying responsible. Now, those things really are about learning and reading the material there about what is a plea as an offer, what is the, the issue of jurisdiction. They're claiming already jurisdiction over you. That's already a done deal. With the, with the EDP, it's not just the EDP, it's the decree of nullity winding up their any claim of guardianship, it's a revocation of powers of attorney, winding up any claim of, of attorney that they're using against you. So I'd suggest to anyone that's facing court to read all of that and in your own mind really go away and, and practice how you would stand in court and know exactly who and what you are and be conscious in the moment that they cannot perfect their jurisdiction over you if you have administratively put those through. So if they move ahead, look at the notes in terms of demurra. You know, question, call for a stay and for the, for the issue of law to be established of, of what element of jurisdiction, um, how they're justifying the jurisdiction over you. There isn't, and I wish there was, but there isn't a magic form of words, a monologue that you can use that magically causes it all to go away. Yes, they have been doing this for years. They are professionally trained. You're doing it to save your life. It's grossly unfair, grossly unfair, and it is certainly not the way the law should be. But having said that, the facts are the facts. And the fact is that you need to be competent enough to stand there and think logically what they're doing to you and how they're doing it to you and how to deal with it. At the end of the day, I, I, I can give you all that we know and all that we learn, but I can't give you a magic form of words because when you go into that court, every court case is different. Every matter is different. 
So I just want to make that clear what I was saying, that the EDP is merely 